Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and today we have a couple of Amiga 500s in for repair. I believe this one over here has a faulty disk drive and this one here shows a garbled screen when it's first powered on. So let's sort out the faulty disk drive first and then we'll come back to the very yellowed A500. I believe this one doesn't have any screws holding it together. No it doesn't. Well, that makes things easy. So to capture the video output from this, I'm just gonna use the monochrome video output. I do actually have a SCART cable for one of these. Uh, the issue with it is it's gone incredibly hard. So uh, it is quite annoying to work with. If anyone has any ideas on how to soften up these cables, put it in the comments. All right, let's power this thing on. And we're looking good. So it's asking for the workbench disk and I can hear the disk drive clicking away. So it does seem to be working up to this point anyway. Let's just throw in the super handy Amiga test kit, see what it does. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. It sounds like the spindle motor is trying to spin, but it might be stuck. Uh, let's Oh, and this drive is missing the little eject button. Let's see if I can... There we go. So, let's pull the drive out and take a closer look at it. And all the screws holding the RF shield are also missing. Ooh, and some of the tabs are missing too. Um, so yeah, these, yeah, this one's about to break off. These tabs, after you twist them in and out a couple of times, they will eventually just snap off. Not a big deal. Not too concerned about RF shielding, but I am a little worried in case one of the other tabs has broken off inside. Doesn't look like it though. All right, let's get this disk drive out, take a closer look. And it's also not held in. There is the single screw that normally slots in here, but uh, that wasn't tightened up either. Once again, makes our life easier, I guess. So this drive is one of the Epson SMD 400 drives. There are a number of different drives used in the Amiga 500s. Uh, I don't think I've seen the Epson one before, but it looks like this one literally just pops open. There's a couple of clips around the side that seem to hold the lid on poorly. Cool, there we go. And the spindle motor is actually under there. It does feel like it's turning freely, so maybe it's not the motor. So the stepper motor is clicking the head back and forth, which is pretty normal. Let's have a look, see what it does if it thinks there's a disc inserted. So there's two sensors up the front of the drive here. One of them is just for the right protect sensor on the disc. And the other one is to tell the drive that a disc has been inserted. So let's push one of these down. I think that's the right protect. So it's gonna be the one further in. With any luck, the motor should spin. Yes, it does. So it seems to be detecting that a disc has been inserted correctly. It's just not reading it. And everything else seems to be working as expected. So let's just give these heads a quick clean. Maybe we'll get lucky and it's just dirty heads. So a bit of 99% IPA on a Q-tip and we'll just gently rub over the bottom head and also the top head under this plate. Doesn't look like anything came off them, but you never know. Let's just give it another test. No, still not happy. I am a little bit concerned about this ribbon cable. It seems to have been bended in odd directions. So it could just be a faulty cable. What I think we should do is pull a drive out of another Amiga 500 that we know has a working disk drive, make sure that it's not something like this cable or something on the main board itself that's causing an issue. 
So this is my Amiga 500. Let's just make sure this is still working. Perfect. All right, and this one has a Matsushita drive in it. Let's get it out. All right, so let's see if my known working drive works with this machine. Oh, no. No, it does not. Interesting. So maybe actually a fault on the main board somewhere. I suppose one last thing we can try is a GoTek that eliminates any issues with motors and floppy disk drives. Let's see what the GoTek does. Yeah, right. So even the GoTek just clicks away. It doesn't actually load anything, even though I've got the Amiga test kit disk inserted into this as well. Hmm. Just to rule out any issues with this drive, let's hook it up to uh, my Amiga, see what it does. All right, so there's actually nothing wrong with the drive itself and nothing wrong with this ribbon cable either. So definitely an issue on the main board of that one. Well, I'm pretty sure the even CIA is gonna handle most of the uh, interfacing with the disk drive on these machines. So we can swap over the even CIA and the odd CIA, see if that makes any difference. And the legs on these look mostly fine. A little bit bent in one corner, but that's okay. All right, with the CIA swapped around, let's just use the GoTech again. At least we know it's 100% reliable. That's loading. There we go. So there's a good chance that this CIA is bad, which is what was over here before. Let's swap them back over, see if that fault comes back with the disk drive. Yeah, that same messed up thing. So it sort of accesses the drive, but then doesn't actually read anything from the disk. So let's take this CIA, put it in my machine, see if it does the same thing. Let's see what happens. Yep. Does the same thing in my machine, so 100% a faulty CIA. That is bad. So I'm glad I didn't go down the path of pulling the drive apart and cleaning it out and, you know, looking for other faults with it because there's nothing wrong with that drive. It's an electrical fault and not a mechanical one. So if you've got a second machine that you know is working, it's always worth swapping parts over, see if the fault follows the part itself or stays with that machine. Um, I don't know if I've got a spare 8520 CIA. These are different from the CIA used in the Commodore 64. So. Uh, I'll have to see if I've got a spare one of these. So it looks like I don't have a spare 8520 on hand, so I'm just gonna borrow the one from my machine for now, just so I can make sure the other A500 is now fully functional. So let's get the original disk drive back in. Hook all that back up. And put the original keyboard back in, because this one is from my machine. All right, let's throw our disc in. It does sound a little noisy, but maybe that's just the drive itself. This keyboard doesn't appear to work. How annoying. 
the reset does. Nothing. Let's just use the mouse to get into the keyboard test, see if any keys work. Nothing. No response at all. Wonder if that 6570 chip is bad. That basically takes all the keyboard inputs and multiplexes them or whatever. Could be that. And given that none of the keys work, I doubt it's going to be an issue with, you know, dirty keys or anything, or even this ribbon cable, because you'd expect at least a key to work, but this is completely dead. Only the LEDs seem to work and the reset keys. Let's just take a little peek at this board back here, see if we spot any obvious issues. Oh, don't see any bad joints. Hmm. Maybe we should swap this little controller board between keyboards. It's got to desolder this ground point here. All right, that's our board free. And because I've opened that connector, it should just slide out. Nice. Yeah, I don't see any issues with those ribbon contacts. Uh, they look a bit dark on this side. Mm. Right, well anyway, that's our board. Let's just swap it over, see if it works with the other machine. What is going on with that? Lump of solder. <laughs> it almost looks like there's just a big lump of desoldering braid on this one uh, that's holding that ground connection together. Make sure to open that up. I think that is out. Yes, it is. All right, well, let's try this board with our working keyboard. See what happens. All right, we've got the potentially faulty keyboard controller with a known working keyboard. Let's see how this goes. Ah. It works, totally. So the issue is not with this board, it's uh, with the actual keyboard itself. It was a bit unexpected. So in theory, if I put my working board in this non-working keyboard, it still won't work. Let's see. Okay, so now it's working. So it could just be that the ribbon connector was somewhat dirty and the simple act of pulling it out and putting it back in has resolved that because um, yeah, both of these keyboards are now fully working. Okay. And in terms of the ribbon connectors themselves, they both pretty much look the same. I think there is like a carbon coating over them. So they do look black almost but uh, I'm not gonna try and scrub that off. I'm pretty sure that is supposed to be there and it's supposed to look like that. Yep, it all seems to be working fine again. So um, yeah, it could have just been a bad contact there that uh, has resolved itself. I don't wanna put contact cleaner in there because uh, like I said, it's got those sort of what looks like carbon pads on the connector. So I don't really wanna rub that off with contact cleaner. So um, I guess uh, we'll have to call this good. Um, let's just go through and make sure everything else is working. Uh, let's do floppy drive tests. 
just do a read test on the floppy drive, but I don't think we're gonna come across any issues. Um, it looks pretty clean in there, so I won't worry too much about, you know, re-lubricating everything. Seems to be working just fine. Yep, no issues there. We'll do a quick write test. So I'll just grab a blank disk. If I can eject this bastard. Yep, writing works just fine. Ah, uh, better check the audio, which means I actually have to plug audio in. We've got audio. It's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Video tests, well, we're not gonna see any color, but uh, there are gradients in there, so color should be working just fine. I'll check that with the um, RGB cable just to make sure, but I don't think there's gonna be an issue there. Cool, everything appears to be working just fine with this machine. I'll just do a final test, boot up Workbench, make sure that works. Yep, that loaded up. And we seem to be all good here. Cool. I'm happy to say that this Amiga 500 is now working. So we had a bad CIA and 8520 and a slightly dodgy keyboard connector that seems to have resolved itself. So uh, I'll uh, put all this back together and we'll take a look at the very yellowed Amiga 500. And that is where we'll have to leave this one because this very yellow to Mega 500 is taking a little bit longer than I expected. So um, I'll call this one part one and in part two, we'll look at this guy and see what's up with it. But uh, for now, uh, that's gonna be it. If you wanna see part two early, um, Patreon is where it's at. By the time you're seeing this video, the second part would already be uploaded to Patreon. So um, if you wanna support the channel, get ad-free early access, all that kind of stuff, that's where it's at. But failing that, um, you'll just have to wait till next week to see what happens. Thank you all for watching. A huge thanks to the people that support the channel and I will catch you in the next one. Bye.